I want to read from the book of Luke chapter 10 and verse 30. Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho <clears throat> and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, all right, take care of him. Whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Wow. It's so Lord that God help me to preach. Father, in Jesus' name, I stand here to bear witness of the finished work of Jesus Christ. I stand to bear witness of the things that you have done for your people. Lord, I ask for fluency and clarity of speech. Thank you for utterance. Thank you for the spirit of revelation and understanding. That as I speak your word today, the sick will be healed. Your people will be strengthened. Situations will be changed. And that there will be notable transformation in the lives of your people. I thank you for the opportunity to declare truth. I do it with appreciation in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. So today I want to talk about paid and prepaid. Now, this story is very interesting because, number one, it's a parable. When we are talking about parables, Jesus was using things that used to happen every day, things that people are familiar with, people that people, things that people knew. They were a part of their daily lives and occurrences. And he wanted to teach truth. Yeah, he wanted to teach truth about God. He wanted to teach truth about the kingdom of God. And he wanted to teach truth about himself and about them. So instead of just speaking statements that the people were not able to connect with, Jesus used stories that they were able to relate with. He used characters. Sometimes he would use names that they were very, very familiar with. And this is such a story. And this is such, uh, 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 you know, an illustration of Jesus Christ. We must go beyond the illustration and, and the story, because everybody knows the story of the Samaritan, uh, 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 you know, a good Samaritan. But it's good for us to go deeper and find out what was Jesus trying to portray. Because some of these stories are not just, they have layers and layers of revelation. They have layers of meanings. And therefore, when you look at it from the first layer, you will just see a man who goes on the roadside and picks up a man who was wounded, puts him on a donkey and takes him to the inn, gives him first aid, takes him to the inn. And that's the end of your understanding. 
But what is it that Jesus wants to reveal? What is it that Christ wanted us to know or his disciples to know? And that is what we are going to be talking about today. And I pray that you catch the spiritual reality that is in this parable. Praise God. And I pray that it makes sense to you. Somebody shout and say amen. So he talks about a man that is traveling, that is, that is going down. The Bible says, um, a certain man went down. That word, instead of went up, it talks about went down. It's metaphorical. It's talking about a descent. It's talking about a de degradation. It's talking about a decline that this man was in a particular place, but he made a decision. And because of that decision, there seemed to be a decline, a going down. And the Bible says that this man was going down from a place called Jerusalem. Jerusalem is known to be the city of God. Jerusalem is, man, is called the city of the great king. According to the old, that people wanted to be close to God, when people wanted to worship and sacrifice, when people wanted to engage in worship, they went to Jerusalem. So he's not just picking any city. There is a reason why he didn't pick Bethany. There is a reason why he did not pick Capernaum. Because he had in mind the character of the city that he's talking about. Hallelujah. The attractiveness or the attraction of Jerusalem was because of the worship of God was because of the ceremonies and the festivals, was because of the temple, was because that is where the house of God was. And therefore they went to Jerusalem, people gathered from wherever they were, and they came to Jerusalem to honor God and to pray and to serve God and to worship God. Are, are we clear? So Jerusalem is a place of peace. It's called a Jerusalem or city of peace. So Jesus said that there is this man that he was in a particular place. He was in a place called Jerusalem, that place of peace, that place that, you know, the, the, the demonstration of the worship of God was regular and it was, uh, was frequent. If you dwelt in Jerusalem, you wouldn't go a few weeks without a festival. You wouldn't go a few months without wondering what are all these people gathering for? Why are they bringing animals? Why are they bringing bulls? Why are they bringing sacrifices? Why? Because every now and then there was something happening in Jerusalem concerning God. Are you hearing me? They had festivals and the command was that every man, every male that, you know, was from the stock of Israel was supposed to travel from where they were and come to Jerusalem in what is called a pilgrim feast. And therefore, now every now and then, and that's my point, that there were things that used to happen in Jerusalem. It was known for the worship of God. It was known for festivals. It was known as a place where when people wanted to worship God, this is where they came. If they wanted a festive to celebrate, this is where they came. And that is where Jesus is telling us about this man, that that is where he was. But he made a decision or something lured him towards Jericho. Now, if you look at Jericho now, the character of Jericho is different. That there was nothing godly about Jericho. In fact, if you go back to the Old Testament, you realize that after, after, after Joshua had entered into Jericho, they left a curse. They said, whoever will raise the foundations of Jericho, he will do it at the cost of the life of his firstborn. Whoever raises the gates of Jericho, why? Because Jericho was a place of darkness. Jericho was a place of sin. It was a place of wickedness. Jericho was a place of such immorality that if they wanted, the spies wanted to hide, the place that they found they could hide was in the house of a harlot. And not just any harlot, because there were so many harlots. So they had to leave a sign outside the window. They said, you know, no, don't go to the house of any harlots because there are many. He said, there will be a particular harlot's house that has a scarlet thread at the window. And that is where you, these are the, this, the house of Rahab. 
That is the hard lot you will spare. Why? Because there were many. Are, are you getting? There was something about Jericho that when God wanted to give it to children of Israel for, for as, as their first victory into, into the promised land, he said, I'm going to wipe Jericho out of the face of the earth, that they will not even locate the debris and, and the stones. For Jericho, the walls did not fall. The walls sank. They sank. They, they, he, said to, he, he said to Joshua, for Moses, I, I opened up the sea, and for you, I'm going to open up the rock and the rock is going to swallow this city and the Bible says that is what happened because God had a testimony against Jericho but this guy wakes up one morning and decided that's where I'm going to go and that is why Jesus said that there was a certain man who was going down turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor don't go down Oh man, that can preach. Tell your neighbor, don't go down. It doesn't matter how much pressure you are under. It doesn't matter what people are saying about you. It doesn't matter what the sad the doctors have said. Keep your faith where it's supposed to be. Keep your focus on Jesus Christ. Don't go down. Don't come up one morning and say, I've tried and I have waited. I am going to try there. Don't go down. Somebody shout and say, Amen. Amen. He decided, I want to go try Jericho. Oh, Jericho was attractive because it was a place of flashy lights, loud music, and smartly or scantily dressed women. It was attractive if you wanted to see this or the other, but that was not the place to go for this man. The Bible says that Jericho was so bad that even before you got to Jericho, there was danger. You didn't even have to wait to get there. Right on the way to Jericho, there were problems. And that is what the man discovered as he was going down to Jericho. The Bible says that thieves fell on him. <laughs> oh, thieves fell on him. And the Bible says the man was dressed, but he found himself naked. They, he, they took away his clothing. And the Bible says that they hurt him, they wounded him. And as if that was not enough, they left him for dead. That they did not leave him when they stole from him. They did not leave him when they wounded him. They left him when they thought that he was finished. Oh my God, I feel like I want to preach this morning. It's the, it's the, 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 the thieves saw a man. And the Bible says that when they saw this man, they came after him because they liked what the man was dressing. When he talks about garments, he talks about the garments of righteousness. That in the Old Testament, God, that the righteousness we have, is, it was a garment. They had to put on garments. They had to put on a linen. They had to put on a garment for them to walk into the presence of the Lord. But in the New Testament, for us, the righteousness is not a garment. Righteousness for us is a nature. Jesus has given us something that the, the, the rust cannot corrupt and the thieves cannot steal from me. Somebody shout and say amen. But the old time, the garment could be stolen and whatever they had as possession, it could be taken away. They could be ambushed by robbers and the robbers would make away with whatever they had. But whatever Jesus has given us, it cannot be stolen. Oh, the preciousness of that grace and the riches of Christ can never be stolen from me. There is no robber in hell. There is no devil in hell that can take out of the hands of Christ what he has given to the church. Somebody shout and say amen. Therefore, this story is a parallel of Christ. It's a story of Christ where humanity descended into darkness. That which was born free became a slave of sin. They were born in sin. They, were, they dwelt in iniquity. They were lured by pleasure. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way. They have come to a place uh, oh, where, where we, for us, uh, I mean for sinners, it is like spot for a fool to commit sin. It's like spot, they become inventors of evil. And that is what happened on their way down to Jericho. Are you, are you following me? 
And the Bible says that which destroys beset us, stole from us. We became background, wounded and hurt. But I want to thank God because of his son, Jesus Christ. Are you still following me? The Bible says they stripped him and left him naked. As if that was not enough, they wounded him and hurt him. As if, they could, as if that was not enough, they wanted to kill him. And when they were convinced that he was dead, is when they left him. The thief came to steal. He came then to destroy. He comes to hurt. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. But I am come that they might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Jesus has come for a reason. And the Bible says that after the man, I want, I want to have time to pray. After this, I'm going to be quicker. The Bible says after the man was left for dead, here comes the, the priest. He's a symbol of the law. He's a symbol of those that are supposed to be teachers of the law. They are supposed to be the ones who stand before people and pronounce the benefits of the law and reveal the heart of God in the law. But the Bible says when he comes uh, across the wounded, uh, he, the Bible says it was not even intentional. He did not go there deliberately because the law had been turned uh, from about being about people to being about status, being about regulations. He said to Jesus, why are you healing them on the Sabbath? You would rather leave them sick uh, but keep a statute. You'd rather leave them. And Jesus Jesus would ask them, you, if you had a donkey and it fell in a pit because it is the Sabbath, would you leave that donkey in a pit or would you pick it up? He said, I would go pick it up or I would water my donkey or even on a Sabbath. But because it is a person for the sake of the law, to keep the law, you want them to continue sick. You want them to continue in bondage so that a tenet of the law is not broken. Are you getting my point? They had lost the meaning of the law. They had lost the purpose of the law. The law was given for people. He said, God did not give us the Sabbath for the, uh, I mean, the man for the Sabbath. But the Sabbath was supposed to be for man. It was supposed to benefit man. It is not the other way around. It was supposed to be an idol for men. It was not supposed to keep men in bondage. It was not supposed to keep people in suppression. But it was supposed to be the day that people are freed into worship and into consciousness and to the awareness of their God. So they had turned things around. The Bible says it was not even deliberate that it was by chance by chance he happened to oh to pass there praise the name of Jesus and he saw a wounded man and he did not feel like he needed to bow down and take care of this man he did not feel like he wanted to associate himself with the blood that had been dripping into the soil because he had a self-righteousness I don't want to dirty myself I don't want to soil my righteousness I don't want to contaminate myself but he was also going down. You know, sometimes people who criticize you think they are going up as they criticize, but they don't know that how come you want to sana. Oh my God. Are you hearing me? The Bible says he was also going. Somebody say he came down. A certain priest came down. The places where the priest was supposed to be functioning is in Jerusalem. What was he going to Jericho for? What was he going? The place of festivities and festival and sacrifices and bull offerings is Jerusalem. The place of the altar and the place of the temple is where? Is Jerusalem. There was no temple for the Jews in Jericho. But the Bible says even him with his self-righteousness was dealing with something. He had a secret enticement to Jericho. There was something that was pulling him. And the Bible says he left the guy. And the Bible says a Levite came left the man there <laughs> and then the Bible says, here comes a man. 
The, the only thing we are, not, we are told is, is, is he was a Samaritan. He, he, was, he was from this, this region and from this place that was looked down upon. From this place where people didn't want associations with. How come you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, to give you water? Knowing that Jews and Samaritans have no dealings. Oh, he was coming from this region where people had rejected. They say, God cannot be in them. God cannot use them. They cannot be a part of the covenant. They cannot be a part of the promises. They cannot be a part of the of the of the covenant of Abraham. So they were segregated. And the Bible says one of that kind. Hey, one of that kind was passing there. And the Bible says uh, as he was passing there, he saw this wounded man. He saw wounded and he did not see the wounded. Uh, he did not pass the wounded man. He knelt down and he started to take care of this wounded man. And that is how God chose for his son to come. Instead of his son come, coming into the world dressed in philanthropies, dressed in the robes of priesthood, his son came from, from a manger. He was born in a manger. He grew up in Nazarene. He was a Galilean. He came from the ghettos of those days. They even sat when they were talking about him. They sat and discussed and he says, such and see that out of Nazareth there cannot come a prophet. Where Angalia evidence, go into your history and see that Nazareth has never brought forth a, a prophet. This is just the son of Mary. He's the son of Joseph, the son of a carpenter, but he is the help he sent. Oh God, hallelujah. He is the Savior. How can you, you know, one of the things that is very, very interesting about people, and that is why people miss their miracles, is because they want to dress up the help. They want to dress up the vessel. They want to dress up. You know, when people start to dress up the vessel that God, they want God to use, it is not the vessel they are after. It's not the help they are after. They are after glamour. But when you really need a miracle, you don't know, don't care whether he's a Samaritan or not. When you really need help, you don't care where the person comes from. God, I need help. And God sent help in the, in, the, in the form of a Samaritan. Oh, he sent us help in the form of his son who grew up oh, through a single parent. The father died early. The father Joseph died early. So he was raised by Mary alone. He grew up so he can understand what it means to be in a single parent family. He knows what what it means to be rejected when he stood up and he announced the vision and he said I have been anointed to heal the broken hearted to preach the good news to the poor they rejected him I don't think it's because they didn't expect a Messiah but it is the man who spoke that word that they had a problem if it is Caiaphas who had spoken up and stood and said the Lord had anointed me to heal the broken hearted and to set the captives free they would have clapped but because he was a Galilean he had come from Nazareth because he was the son of a carpenter they said where you, 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 you. they took him and they wanted to throw him off the cliff because they had a problem with God's choice of the vessel hallelujah it's going to get better. Can I go on? So the Bible says it's a Samaritan. And when he was passing, the Bible says, somehow, this Samaritan had what it takes. Somehow he had carried bandages. Somehow he had carried oil and wine. It is the priest who is supposed to have the oil. It is the priest who was told, you are never supposed to let the light in the temple uh, stop burning. You are always to walk with a jerrycan of oil and fill up every lamp in the temple. But the Bible says, round about now, the priest has nothing to offer and the Levite has not done it. It's talking about the bankruptcy of the law. 
that the law has come to a place where it can no longer help. The people are there, they are wounded. The people are there, they are hurting. They need more than a part in the brook and the law is not able to help because the law could not make anyone perfect. The law could never take away sin. The way the law could never make us new creation. The law could not bring a people and make them uh, who are not a people and make them a people. The law would never bring us into union with Christ. The law would never uh, deliver us out of darkness and bring us into the dominion of his of his of the son of his love. The law fell short as far as those things were concerned. And at that particular time, the Levite was an unprofitable and the priest was an unpro- unprofitable. The only benefit came from this Samaritan who somehow, I love this, had been equipped but wondering for what? Had been carrying things but didn't know, when am I going to use these things? When am I going to apply what I have? When am I going to open the depths of my heart and spirit and be a benefit to my generation. He was just carrying healing. He was carrying help within himself. But he had not seen the manifestation of that help yet. And I am talking to people that are full of the gifts of God. Full of the grace of God. Some of you are wondering, Lord, apart from the business you give, what can I do in your kingdom? Apart from the job you have given me, apart from the business I run, apart from the marriage and the family, what can I do? How can I help somebody? I've come here all the way from where I was to tell you that you're not empty, that you've been carrying some healing and you don't even know it, that you're an encourager and you're not even aware that you can be used to pick up somebody and you're not even aware of it. And this is your time to rise. This is your time for your manifestation. Station. This is your time for you to look into your spirit, into that bag that you've been carrying, into those resources you've been carrying, into that capacity that you've been carrying, and let it be a blessing to somebody. Use it to shake your world. Use it to transform society. Use it to bring somebody to Jesus. Use it to bring somebody to hope. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. This Samaritan Terry, 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 she would have said, I come from a bad background. I come from rejected people. I come from unwanted people. I come from people that are not, uh, you know, esteemed to be much or uh, they are not estimated to be much. He would have gotten into self-pity right now. He would have gotten to a place of, of feeling inadequate. Uh, but right now when he saw the man that was wounded, all of a sudden, the the Bible says there was compassion. There was a movement in his heart. Please never ignore what is happening in your heart. The Lord leads you by heart. He does not lead you by taking your hand. Although we have sung songs and say, Oh Lord, take my hand. Take my hand and lead me. God is not going to do that. He will lead you by the heart. He will grip your heart. And that is how I knew I'm called into ministry. He got hold of the, of the heart of a, 20, of a tender 20 year old. And he started to minister. He started to deal with that heart. He dealt with my heart. Sometimes I would pray, My God, I don't want even to go there. I get, I get emotional when I go there. I would pray and I got back to my wife and I'll tell my wife honey I don't know what God is doing I don't know I can't interpret what's happening in my heart and then one day came, I, I, my favorite scripture was he understands the tossings of my heart he knows the changes that come to my heart sometimes I feel happy sometimes I want to be alone sometimes I cook and I don't want to eat sometimes I he knows the tossings of my heart because he draws you by the heart people who don't know the leadership of God are people who have ignored what he's doing in their heart. 
before he pulls you before he uses you before he could heal the wounded before he could get out the oil before he could get out the wine he had to do something in the heart of that Samaritan ask your neighbor what's going on in your heart that is why the Bible says guard your heart with all diligence has kept the place of bitterness come out from the place ah, where there is contention and that is what God I mean Paul told Timothy his young protege Timothy he said Timothy I put in you my hands I put my hands on you and you have received a gift but as you manifest that gift you have to understand there are things you need to stay away from you need to stay away from contentious people you need to stay away from quarrel some people. You need to throw away from people that are always sharing fables and fables and contention. You need to stay away. That is the way you protect your heart. There are things I refuse to read. There are things I refuse to watch. There are places I refuse to go. There are reports I refuse to listen. Tell your neighbor, keep your heart. God watches the heart. The God looks, you know, when God is calling you, that is why sometimes if you look at what God is using and people God is using, they would not even have chosen themselves. But the heart was in the right place because God is looking at the heart. Oh, God's marking scheme is the heart. Keep your heart clean. There are things I refuse to be a part of. And this our city is known for. I refuse to be a part of it. I refuse to be a part of it because my heart is precious to me. The workings of God in the Samaritan began in the heart. Compassion. As he journeyed, came to where he was and when he saw him, he had what? This is the beginning of the flow of the gifts of the Spirit. Because remember the gifts of the Spirit was to benefit all. God cannot use people to, to be an encouragement if they have not compassion. God cannot use people to heal if that person does not have compassion. If they, are, they, they don't care about sick people. If they don't care about people who are struggling. If they don't care about the poor, God cannot use them. It begins in the heart and therefore friends as I preach to you this morning. Note what is happening in your heart. Check what is going on in your heart. Because that's where it begins. God communicates with your heart. Grace is strengthened or is released into your heart. The Bible says it is good that the heart be strengthened by grace and not by foods. That there is no food you can eat. And then you tell people, Hey, chakule imeni paneema. That you have grace because that the grace has increased because you have eaten. He says that the strengthening of the heart is by grace. That even when God wants to strengthen you, He does not aim at your physical man, your outward man. He aims your heart. That is the place of true strength. So the Bible says the man had compassion. He felt compassion. And the Bible says, go to the next verse, verse 34. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds. Where did he get bandages? And the Bible says, Pouring oil and wine. Compassion makes you a willing giver of what God has given you. This man didn't even ask. But the Bible says he bent down. He took that which he's already been, he's always, he was carrying the bandages and he bound the man. He poured the oil and he poured the wine, praise the name of Jesus. 
and he said I could get, talk to you about the characteristics of oil and wine because I don't have time. The Bible says he set him on his own animal. This I see grace. The man opted to walk so that this wounded man can be carried. So this guy is moving, but it's not by his effort. I had to change the message of the yesterday. Because this is not... When I'm teaching, I say I'm teaching. It's prophetic for somebody. And the prophetic I mean is not the prophetic... Anyway, the prophetic I mean is that there are things that are supposed to be happening in your life. If where you are going, you will carry yourself. God is not working. But you need to come to a place in your life and say, Lord, how did I get here? How have I come this far? Only those kind of people can come to a place and say, God, you are Ebenezer. Because it's not about my background, it's not about my education, it's not about my connection. In fact, sometimes connections will let you down. Let me tell you something. If you are there and you say, Oh, kila mtu napishia mlango na nyamaza, inakuwaga ivo. That is how God sets you up when he wants to be the only one who carries you. Are you hearing me? So he said, Abraham spoke and he said, So that... You never say, I made Abraham rich. He says, God, God wants to take the sole praise for your life. He will cause people to promise and not do. They say, I'll come, I'll be there for you, and they are not. He saw that whatever he is doing, you will not have to write a letter and tell somebody, come and see your way away. If it were not for you. Uh, no, no, no. God wants you to kneel down in your house and say, Lord, if it were not for the Lord, that was, is there anybody who is there now? Is there somebody who is in a place and you're saying, Lord, if you don't open this door, I have sent my card, I have sent messages, I have sent WhatsApp, I have emailed, I have written physical letters, but this door is not opening. I have tried to tell people to introduce me to the door openers, but it's still not working. And you've gotten to a place and you're saying, Lord, only you can take me there. Today, grace is working in your life. May the grace of the Lord, that is called the grace for elevation, the grace that carries men to places where you cannot get by your feet. I pray that you experience the carrying of grace. Somebody shout and say, bear me Lord. He said, I will bear you up. He said, you remember how I bore you up from Egypt with the wings of an eagle. You thought you were walking, but I was the one bearing you up. I pray in that jaw that the Lord will bear you up, that you will be carried, that you will go into the rhythms of grace where you see you are moving, but your movement is not commensurate with your effort. It's not according to your qualification but it's according to the workings of God. And it happens when God wants to fulfill a promise. When God wants to fulfill his word. And there is somebody ready. And there is somebody whose heart is open. He does not consider any other condition. He does not consider how many doors have been closed. He does not consider how many people have said no. He does not consider how many times you have failed. He just picks you up and he walks with you. And he tells you, here is this this is what I prepared you for. Somebody shout and say amen. amen. I declare the grace. I declare the grace. I declare the grace of God that you will pick up speed by the grace of God that wherever you are wherever you are in that critical moment in your business that you will experience the influence the infusion of the grace of God as you go to the next level I've been talking about manifestation I'm talking I've been talking about levels and, and dimensions of manifestation now I declare the grace to go there I declare the capacity to go there Pray the name of Jesus. 
he was left for dead he was left but there was one who was not ashamed of his wounds there was one who was not intimidated of his condition he said you look beaten up but I will you. Everybody has rejected you, but I can walk with you. Everybody has said no to you, but you are the vessel I still want to use. And the Bible says this Samaritan picked up the wounded man. He was not afraid of the wounds. He was not afraid of the bleeding. He was not afraid. He picked him and he put him on his animal. He said, I've got the strength to cover the distance. I will use my resources for the benefit of this guy. I will use my ability to take him where he was going. I will use whatever my animal to take him where he was supposed to go. And God is saying, my power is available to you. My grace is available to you. Allow me to take you where I've wanted to take you. Allow me to lead you. Allow me to take you there. Somebody shout and say amen. Hallelujah. And there's something I have to throw in. This is free of charge. There's something I have to throw in. In that place there were robbers. In that place there were thieves. But this Samaritan man, this the good Samaritan, was not afraid of thieves. Because there is something when you carry, you don't have to worry about what's going on around you. He says that the same power that brought you there can protect you from what is going on around you. There could be robbers but there are people the robbers can rob from oh my god there could be witch doctors but there are people that cannot be hexed he said you don't have to live in fear that there will be a murogi to rob and he says there, can, there shall not be divination against Jacob and there will not be witchcraft against Israel he said I give you power and authority to walk over scorpions and snakes and they shall not harm you he me the God that is given you that idea the God that is raising you up is able to protect you yeah. why am I saying this friends it's because sometimes the concern for safety can be distracting the concern for safety can be distracting. Instead of you focusing on what God is doing, you're so concerned about what people will do, what people will say. Oh, what if somebody comes and what if they rise against you? If they rise against you, they cannot pull you down because the one, you are securely in the hands of the one that is raising you up. I let us have God without fear of people. Can I say it again? Walk like somebody who knows that God is on your side. If God be for me, who can be against me? Sometimes we are overconscious of those guys around. What could happen? What if? We are afraid of invisible unseen dangers. And that is what is called fear. But I've come here to tell you that there is a possibility of a fearless life. God has not given you the spirit of fear. Oh, building your business with the fear that it might fall down one day. Is that what God told you? That he's giving you season of prosperity? Is that what the Bible says? That goodness and mercy shall follow you for a season? Are you favored for a season? Therefore why are you serving God? Why are you doing what God called you to do? With the fear that you will be ambushed. I stopped. I stopped. Fear comes with torment. The Bible says fear not. Those who can only wound the body and cannot do anything more than that. Fear instead the one who is able to take the soul into hell. May you be set free from the distractions of fear. The man did his thing without asking himself what about the thieves? These ones who stole from this man and wounded this man, could they be waiting for the next victim? Are you hearing me? No, no, no. He wasn't conscious of that. He knelt down patiently. It was not hurried. The Bible says he went down, bandaged him. 
poured oil. Poured wine. He took time. Without him thinking. What about the robbers? Somebody shout and say I'm protected. Fanya biashara na roho moja. Praise the name of Jesus. Serve God without fear. Be delivered from fear if you're here. The Bible says he carried him on his own animal. There's that place. The Bible says you shall ride on the high places of You can no longer say I did, I did, I did, I did. I made the first step, second step, third step. You come to a place and said, I just trusted in God. Amen. I just hoped in Him. I just called on Him and He took me. Praise the name of Jesus. And I am praying. I don't know. I came. I changed this message for somebody who's been saying, Lord, I've tried. I'm even fatigued. I've been trying. I'm getting tired. I've been trying. Oh God, I'm running out of ideas and I'm running out of strength. And God is saying, Grace is come to you. Strength has come to you. Help has come to you today. Receive strength in Jesus' name. Somebody shout and say, Amen. I declare strength. Somebody shout and say, Strength. Please have a seat. I want to finish this message. Please give me the keys. Oh, hallelujah. It's by the grace. It's by the grace. I want to see in my life what only your grace can do. I don't want what I can do by my wisdom, by my experience. I don't want what my friends can help me to do. I want what God only can do. Take me where only you can take me. Is there your prayer? Is that your prayer? May you receive it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. May you receive it. May God take you where you or him only can take you. Where only the hand of God can take you. That's my prayer for you. Praise the name of Jesus. And the Bible says when he carried him, he took him to the inn. The wine is a symbol of blood. The oil is a symbol of the anointing and the workings of the Holy Spirit. Praise the name of Jesus. He poured on him and he put him on that ass. He put him on that uh, donkey, that animal and took him to a place he knew that was safe. He knew where he was taking this man. He did not go wandering around. He knew exactly where he's taking this wounded, this victim, the hurting. He knew where he was taking him, where he can take care. And the Bible calls that place an inn. And the Bible says when he got to the inn, he was not in a hurry. He took care of him still. Praise the name of Jesus. He changed his environment. Took him from the place of danger to a place of rest. He said here you can walk without fear of robbers anymore. Here you can recuperate. Here you can become stronger without the fear of him being ambushed. It's called rest. Somebody shout and say rest. He took him to the inn and the Bible says there he took care of him. That's what I love about Jesus. When he came, he died on the cross and blood flowed and the captives became free. The wounded were healed. The accursed of the earth became bearers of divine blessing. But he said to his disciples, I'm going. I'm going, I'm leaving you. But I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to leave you in the hands of one who can take as good care of you as I've been taking. He's, he's going to take care of you. He's, I'm going to leave you into the hands of one like myself. <laughs> a caregiver like myself don't feel like if I leave you you will lack anything don't feel like if I leave you the care will diminish 
Oh, don't feel like if I leave you, you'll be left alone. No, no, no. He said, I will leave you into the hands of the caregiver. And the Holy Spirit is the one that has been given to us to take care of the bride, to take care of the rescued, to take care of the redeemed of the earth, to take care of those that have been delivered. The Holy Spirit has expressed information to take care of the body of Christ. Those that have been rescued, he is the one who is taking care of us right now. He's the one walking in the church. Are you hearing me? Are you seeing the parallel? Are you getting the, the, the revelation? He said, I'm going. But I'm not going to leave you alone. Calls the caregiver. And tells the caregiver. I'm leaving this one that I have rescued. I am leaving this one that I have saved from the byways. This one that had been attacked, wounded and left for dead, broken hearted. This one that had been rejected of men. This one that was lying by the roadside. I have delivered from that place of darkness. I have carried and conveyed and transferred into the kingdom of the son of his love. I have taken them into the inn where they can have rest and where they can be taken care of. He tells the innkeeper, I have left you with the responsibility of taking care of this man that was wounded. And he goes into his pocket. He says to the innkeeper, take care of him. Yes, Hallelujah. And he gives him payment for what they have already used. And for what he will use. Hallelujah. <laughs> the man was robbed. But now somebody is taking care of his expenses. Somebody didn't know. I'm a favor in a That's how favor comes. He says. Take care of him. Whatever he has eaten, whatever he owes you up to this point, you, cash, he paid. And then he said, you take care of him. This part, this is in Guinea, is for whatever he will use. <laughs> so this guy, where is the wounded? Oh, so no, no. I'm loaded. So this man, whatever he may need, he is never supposed to wake up one day and wonder, oh, Nitatoa Wapi, where am I going to get? Why? Somehow. He had the conversation. And that's where revelation comes in. He had the conversation. He knows what was paid. So this man can stand and say, I don't have a debt. My debt has been paid. I, I am not here on credit. Oh my God. I am, I am not here on credit. I don't know any debt. Jesus paid it all. What is the debt of your freedom? What is the debt you owe him by getting healed? 
What is the debt you should pay him by being filled with the Holy Ghost? Somebody say, I don't have any debt. <laughs> Praise God. Because when he stood at the cross, you're my Jesus now stretch at the cross facing them. These are the people you're dying for. When he stood at the cross, he covered everything that you, every debt you had accumulated. Senior, <laughs> he set you free. He picked you up from the curses and the ways of your grandfathers. He picked you up from everything he delivered you from up to this point. And he said, Yonimeli, I've cleared that invoice. And then he says, as a son, as an heir, as an instrument of God, as a citizen of the kingdom of God, whatever they will need, Shika, he pays. Hallelujah. And then he says to them, Kama kuna yoyote ambaya neza maliza inema. If there is somebody who can spend more than I have provided, don't worry. If this person rises so high that the grace of God becomes depleted, that the grace is no longer enough, that the grace has run out, he said, don't worry. I am no man's debtor. When I come back, he said, he's coming back. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody shout and say, he's coming back. He said, when I come back, whatever they will have spent healing the sick that I did not pay for, whatever they will have spent preaching the gospel that I did not pay for in the cross, whatever it is that they spent that was not in what I took care of, ask me. Ask me. And nobody can ever. Because the grace is limitless. And that is why I've come with a message today. Some of the things that some people are concerned about have been paid for. And yet, some of the things, John, that people are worried about have been prepaid. So as a believer... As you open the word of God and discover, you know, this man can stay in the inn saying, oh, the guy who rescued me left. Now, unataka nini akuna? God forbid. Even in the example. But if this man catches the revelation I'm giving you, and the innkeeper comes to him and says, what is it that you want? Or the innkeeper who is the Holy Spirit says to him, these are the gifts that have been freely and lavishly been given to you. This man will just go through the menu and order like a king. He will be asked, what, what do you want? And he will order according to his revelation. My bishop said some years ago, he says, life does not give you what you deserve. Life gives you what you demand. What you order. Are you hearing? What you catch a revelation and say, by the way, I can have this. I can get it. And you ask for it. And you insist. It will be in your hands. Therefore friends. Whatever bound us. Has been taken care of. Are you hearing me? And wherever we are. Whatever strength. Whatever capacity. The Holy Spirit has it in his hands. <laughs> 